I first met Le Matilia at the AP Christmas party in 2019, back when COVID was just a rumor circulating in China, and shortly before the eruption of the Tal volcano. She wanted to get in touch with me because, like her, I also operated a startup at the intersection of data, technology, and social development. I found her story quite compelling. A young entrepreneur operating a deep technology startup in the public sector in the Philippines. And we've kept in touch ever since. Welcome to Data Ethics Conversations. Today, we talk to Lei Motilia, co-founder of AI for Gov, a startup that helps local governments improve service delivery through artificial intelligence and transform citizen participation. In this conversation, we talk about Lay's journey from public servant to entrepreneur, how local startups can work successfully in the public sector, and the application of artificial intelligence for social development. If you enjoy this podcast, please like us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at EthicsPH, and on LinkedIn at DataEthicsPH. And now my conversation with Lei Motilia. So Lei, thanks a lot for for joining us. Uh, let's just keep this casual, you know. Uh, so how how are things? I understand you were stuck in Vietnam for what? What was it? A few months? I think it was five months. So around what? five five months. months. Mm-hmm. I'm stuck in Vietnam, but it's a very good place to be stuck at because um, <laughs> essentially it's uh, normal there. Uh, we had a period of lockdown, but I think it only lasted for two weeks, and then then that was it. And then you can go to restaurants. So let me get it straight. You were you were there coming into the March lockdown, and then you were that weekend. It was supposed to be a weekend sort of trip, like a headspace weekend trip, and then it became a five months. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so tell me about the experience first before we get to like startup stuff. So, what what's there to do in Vietnam when you're stuck for five months? Work. So, I think <laughs> work. Oh, you were working. Okay, cool. Working a lot. Yeah, I I think I have never, I've never actually explored um, Vietnam. So th- there were um, few uh, restaurants where I always go uh, during the weekends. But essentially, life in Vietnam is just um, the the dinner table and a lot of working for a DOH. So that that was it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So let's start with kind of your journey. So, how long have you been running AI for Gov? When did you? How did you get started? Tell us a little bit about the company. So we're pretty young as a as a Gov Tech startup. So our that our adv- the advice of our mentors is to just stick with a Gov Tech startup. Okay, so we're a Gov Tech startup, uh, Gov but Tech. Mm-hmm. Gov Tech, yeah. Uh, essentially, um, we started as uh, an inspiration uh, coming from our experiences from the public sector. So we worked um, the team. Uh, most of us worked in. Uh, national agencies like the Department of Social Welfare and Development, and then some of us worked in the local government units and in the information office, and then some of us uh, were even in barangay, barangay LGU like SK. So this um, was before before starting the company. You were all in various NSK, yes. parts of right. the government. Okay. Government, yeah. And then what we had in common was we're all uh, youth. Um, leaders you know like uh we spend basically we spend our um after work hours and weekends um doing community volunteering stuff so we were you know we were very active um civic-minded people and then uh something in common as well was the experience working in the government and the shared frustration that you know when you're inside the government you have a lot of ideas but then you feel like oh how am i going to you know, innovate this, too many rules. So that's the, um, that's a commonality and the frustration. What was government service always kind of your, your path from, from college? I mean, I uh, understand you took up uh, uh, ComDev, right? Community development. 
uh, for your for your bachelor's. So yeah. what what did you have in mind when you were studying? Did you did you did you think you were going to start a startup? Uh, no, I, I always wanted to work with the government because I, I think I have a special um, appreciation of structure and the bureaucracy. So, and, you know, I appreciate um, organization and, you know, what it took for our civilization to come up with governments and, you know, be civilized um, societies. And then how I, I, I suppose I have a special appreciation on how uh, structures uh, struggle. So, you know, how you constantly have to um, increment, you know, like incremental innovation, incremental, you know, shaping, like I have a special appreciation with um, geology, you know, how rocks uh, shape in time. And I, I always felt that government is also like that. Um, you, it seems like it's not working, but actually in the, uh, in the innards of it, so the, the processes and the forces um, are working. So whether, whether we see it or not. So I think I've always had that um, um, appreciation of, of government and always wanted to work with the social welfare um, development because I'm a social development geek. I've always wanted to apply sciences in development work. And that's what I did in college a lot. So social network analysis and, wow. you know, I'm, I miss complexity science in, in, in our college. So I think that was, you know, that's the mishmash of um, mental models. Yeah. So, so what was the kind of the trigger to get, to get started? Did you, what, is AR for Gov your first startup or were you involved in other ventures before? Uh, so after college, I went for humanitarian work first. So I, I was one of the first 10 who volunteered to go to uh, the Yolanda, Yolanda site. Like this was right. a third, um, third week of uh, November uh, uh, when, the, when Yolanda um, hit. So uh, I, I volunteered in our college that we are, oh, I'm going there and I'm going to have like the field work there and that supposed to uh, that um, expanded my view of uh, development that gave me the experience to go with you know, hundreds of barangays in a very short period of time do, do, uh, doing humanitarian work and of course I think that after that experience there's no going back and then after that I wanted to do uh, uh, yeah, more social development stuff and, and that's my exposure to UN stuff and all of these uh, which never existed before in my brain. Um, right. So yeah, and then but startup wise, I suppose um, <laughs> the short answer is um, after working uh, with uh, the government, I had a chance. Uh, I, well, I, I had an offer from a Singapore um, a company to lead a sort of 21st century skills uh, program with them. So they're like a charity slash um, enterprise in, in Singapore. And I, you know, I thought maybe I should challenge myself for, you know, a sort of international uh, scene. I didn't really know what I was doing, but, you know, this was my first challenge, how far I can take it. And then I took it. So I went for a Microsoft class and got certified in 21st century skills, blah, blah, blah. And then I bought a couple of certificates for, you know, so that's my first real um, entrepreneurship uh, journey. And I, I think I've proven to myself that I can be confident. You know, prior to that, I don't like speaking English because, right, really? when you're not raised with it, you feel um, embarrassed, like oh, my grammar. I speak like English carabao, like that. So, 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 so Doesn't yeah. It seems like the case now, <laughs> several <laughs> years later. Yeah, just uh, maybe two years, but still, you know, it's not per not still not a perfect mm -hmm. grammar. Yeah. Okay, so uh, tell me about AI for Gov. What's the what's the story? Uh, what, what what was the inspiration, and then what's the mission? Uh, for AI for Gov, um, it was an opportunity when we saw uh, that was a, there was a three three days deadline, three days long deadline na, uh, for Rappler. So there was a post on Facebook, randomly randomly seen post, uh, governance, uh, something, proposal for governance, innovation, hack society, um, 
challenge, something like that. So when, when I saw the description, it was about innovating for government. That was it. So it's like immediately when I saw that, oh my God, three-day deadline, and then you have an essay to fill and a whole team to... So um, <laughs> at that moment, like three hours later, I thought, can we do this? So what I, what I did is I began calling um, friends. Uh, from the volunteer network. So friends that I met in Leyte, people who were working with the government whom I know for volu- uh, in volunteer works. So then I began convincing them, you know, I have this like, idea about this. Do you want to do this with me? And then within a night, I finished like a, an essay with, uh, with another friend who was um, in Sydney. So we like worked on the proposal together and that's so it. So were, you were in Australia at this time? No, no, the, no. Uh, I had oh. a friend who was um, studying masters um, in Sydney, and I, I convinced her because she's very good in writing as well. So uh-huh. it's Fatima, and then we we wrote it together. We refined each other because we work really well, and um, so yeah. And then we submitted it at, in on the dot of the deadline, and then the rest was history. Right, right. Did you? Was it? Did Did you have other competitors for the kind of the the paper you were writing, or what yeah. was the theme? Um, well, there were like four categories, I think. There was media, governance, health, and education. So that was the four uh, thing. What I liked about it was it focused on a theme, right? So when we saw that, yes, governance is our thing. So that's what motivated us to apply. And then that was basically the, the chance to collide Right, your love for government, your love for uh, technology and volunteerism, civic mindedness, and then let's push it into one, and that, and then that was. It. Um, what about the AI angle? What 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 was the inspiration there? Because you could have right. done so many other technology. I mean, there's like blockchain. There's so right. many other things, robotics. So why AI in particular? Well, it, it's that's also pretty random because when we were uh, doing um, AYC, like you know the youth ASEAN youth stuff, uh, one of our volunteers um, said that you know Le, um, we can engage the members by using chatbots. I had no idea what chatbots were uh, at that time, so that was the that was the the beginning. And then what what are these? And then he made like a you know from a chatbot service provider, he made like this. Oh, engage your I know engage your members. So that was my first introduction. Then I began uh, reading about it. And then suddenly I thought, oh, we should, I was still working for the government then. Then I thought, oh, you know, I put it on my post it uh, in my desk in, in, in the SWD. Oh, apply chatbots in the social uh, sustainable livelihood program. So that was one of my concept notes that I was going to do uh, with the SWD before I resigned. And then, so after that, so, you know, it seeds, seeds of, um, seeds of information. And then eventually when I got the exposure in Singapore, that was when I, you know, my world expanded and in Singapore, everything is 21st century skills and AI and in the Philippines, like you walk the streets, there's nothing, but in, in Singapore, like everywhere you see these. So, so, you know, so my, my journey on what is a uh, fourth industrial revolution, etc. So I entered like so many courses online courses on this, MIT courses, etc. So, you know, like to um, dive deeper in a, in a concept that is not um, familiar to me as, a, as my background is very far from, from mm-hmm. this. So basically, I thought that I, there's a special um, a collision between those fields, right? Yeah. So if you're grounded in community development and you have some appreciation or you're not afraid at least, to stretch yourself to understand technology and stuff like that. So yep. then I, I felt that there was something there that has to be pursued. And yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming when, when you started, when you finally got the idea started, did you have the need to bring together like, uh, like what, what was the composition of the team that you put together? Like what kind of uh, skill sets and, and backgrounds? Right. What what I loved about the Hack Society then the application was they were so particular with the team. So they they had it um, clearly stated there as a criteria that it has to be diverse, it has to have this and that. So then that's that's my um, that's my uh, cheat sheet for um, strategically contacting people that I know. So then I got uh, some computer science uh, person and then. Uh, uh, masters in business administration and finance, someone 
who mastered in communications, digital communications, and then so so that's the you know so in were they for- were they all kind of in your network? Uh, when you started, yeah, yeah, yeah. so they were all like my volunteer, um, you know, volunteer network. So we had um bonds, you know, for for uh two to three years. So that it, you know, there's a trust thing uh, going on already to build on. So after that, what was funny was that five people <laughs> who agreed to me with, with like several, you know, different backgrounds, they are not all of them are not available to be in the hack society. <laughs> 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 on that day because it was a Monday and people had to work. <laughs> so right, it right. was so funny. It's like, oh my God, I can't, you know, I can't hack myself. <laughs> so, so so it was funny because then I had to contact again and the dot like Sunday. It was a Monday and then I how long was it, How long was the entire stretch when end to end? Like when you were um, crafting it? Well, three days was the deadline, right? So I, I remember I spent like I did sleep for one night to finish it. And then a Monday uh, was the, I think there was a long time. So they extended the deadline so many times. So they extended the <laughs> deadline so many times. Uh, um, when they extended the deadline, uh, I thought, so I, I suppose like people's schedules moved, right? Because the deadline was extended. And then on the deadline when they announced, okay, we are going to have it I think that was October 29 to 30. Um, uh, yeah, so they weren't available. So I had to call other people to who's going to be available to be there with me. So, so I asked uh, you know, one of my good friends who was also working in local government, who is it okay if you, I know, if you, um, if you uh, take a leave, then I'll get you a hotel, you know, <laughs> take a leave and then go to the, Go to Manila. I'll get you a hotel, and then, you know, so, so just so that we are at team. So that's how it randomly started, and then um, we were three girls without um, computer science backgrounds, and we were figuring it out uh, during that workshop. And we were calling our computer science um, friends, uh, and then we, you know, we were <laughs> basically blind and figuring it out there in that workshop, and. So yeah, so basically it went from a theory, a big theory, to a particular product. So that's um, uh, that workshop helped us. Sorry that that was a lot. Yeah. No, no, no. It's perfect, actually. In, in fact, what maybe if I backtrack even to my own, like I, I was a pretty late bloomer uh, compared to you, no? Uh, I was already in my late 30s when I started my company. And I think one of the biggest, if, if I look back, one of the biggest maybe lessons, uh, I would say that when when you get started in the corporate world you you get comfortable and at at, at a certain point it's too it gets too comfortable to let go <clears throat> like i you know i was senior executive in several companies uh you know and it, it took it was a massive career shift and even I, even for me it, it was uh there was like a middle parang middle ground no like i became a consultant first and then kind of consultant on commission and then later you know, I decided. You know what? I can probably do this already from from you know, from scratch and do it on my own. So in many ways, there's like a, a benefit to starting very fresh, like like you did. Uh, there's less baggage, I would say. <laughs> do you agree with that thought? Like there's really very little to lose when when you start a company. Yes, and there's a lot of fear. <laughs> so there's this constant fear, and you know, I I, I think you you've. Um, felt that as well, right? When we were starting with UH, there was a lot of fear, always the fear of we don't know what we're doing yet, you know, it's like maybe we're not ready and the constant fear. But yeah, I, I think that the courage to stay and be relentless about it uh, builds up the confidence. And then basically after a while, you you look at yourself like, you know, you, you can do it, you know, <laughs> so, so no need to be you know, so afraid. So. Yeah, yeah, correct. What about kind of the, the first question that most people think about starting a business? And of course, uh, we, we all probably have slight, a slightly different story now. Yeah. No? Uh, was, was the funding ever a really big problem getting started? Or, or is it as important as, as many people think? So what, what's your perspective on that? Like starting a company, getting it funded? Mm. Uh, I mean, what's your view on, on how you do that? Um, what we did, Kese, because when you start with like youth volunteerism, you know, like those movements, you never have any funds. 
So there's okay. never a fund, but you're accomplishing stuff. So that was the that was the main uh, that was the first um, layer of confidence that. Uh, when when you're exposed with all of these ideas that you can do sustainable development goals without money, <laughs> yeah, you, you know that you can achieve something without anything. So just time, talent, and other people who are willing to invest time and talent as well. And until you create something that people are actually paying for, so so yeah, so that that's the that's the short answer. I think um, it's really a matter of how. How long can you stay um, limited? So uh, my my work in Singapore helped have mm -hmm. a uh, you know I have a um, bit of a buffer to to try stuff before uh, completely losing it. So yeah. So you had like a war chest. They call it a war chest. You build yeah. a, you build a war chest while while you're you're testing ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so I understand you're you're working for the DOH, uh, or you you you're you're in the middle of a project with them. So tell us about uh, Contra COVID, uh, and and Kira, right? Kira is the name of your of your product. So what's it all about? Uh, so Kira started um, uh, in March. So when I when I went to Vietnam for just the weekend, that that's when where it was born as well, because. Uh, when when in the airport, um, you're still allowed to go out at that time, and there were like I remember maybe forty cases or something, maybe fourteen, so two number cases, and then. Um, the Philippines, you mean? In the or... Philippines, yeah, in the Philippines. Yeah. So that's when we flew, and then, and then, um, and then after that, there was an announcement that on Monday there will be like this lockdown. You know, if you're outside, go back, or if you're inside, you can't go out anymore. Uh, so. Within that time period, we were still uh, with our um, Taal eruption. Yeah, camp. yeah. People yes. kind of forgot that there was a volcano right before yeah. the pandemic. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so we, we were there. We were at the Taal thing. So we were going to uh, have a um, usability testing in evacuation centers of our, of our Taal um, sort of volunteer matching bot, something like that. <laughs> but uh, that didn't pan out because of the... Uh, the evacuation um, visits were all canceled and, you know, flights were canceled and everything. Um, so, yeah, so what we did is we had this um, team call that uh, basically, what are we going to do for COVID? So I received like messages from friends abroad, Lay, why don't you tr uh, turn the chatbots into a COVID response thing? And then after that, I received a message from PCOO, one of the ASICs in PCOO asking me, Lay, uh, aren't you going to do anything uh, about COVID? And then when he asked that, I said, yes, we are doing something about COVID. We are. So just give me give me 24 hours. <laughs> so th at that point, there's nothing yet. So just the idea. And then within 24 hours, we had like this, you know, full don't sleep, you know, don't sleep session again. And then we, we made a quick prototype. Uh, so that was um, Saturday. We had decided Sunday there was a prototype. Monday, we present to DOH. That 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 quick um and then wednesday we have a full proposal concept note and a memorandum of agreement drafted three days that was very quick so so it basically no one slept for for three days that was the most amazing part of the journey i think because we were all pumped up and then um and then wednesday we pitched and discovered there were 11 other chatbot companies in wow in, there's so many chatbots okay <laughs> yeah we didn't even know that they existed and there were international chatbot providers like okay really so big foreign ones. yeah yeah even foreign and we were like oh my gosh why are they here they, you know these are the like chatbot um netflix creators you know like really big uh, people and and we were so, so tiny so we were um quite afraid at that point we had no zero exposure with you know big tech companies yeah uh, yeah so facebook was there viber was there um other tech companies were there and um we were the only ones with a complete um triage prototype which was right. done overnight uh so we had i uh, know we had something we had no backups we had no big companies behind us but what we had was the product itself so we had a screen recording that we have made something that was could be functional within the day if they decided to do so. So, so yeah. So we were backing. Uh, we were banking on that. And then after that, um, the DOH had uh, big guidelines, like um, guidelines on, 
you know, you have to be able to do updates within an hour or something like that, you know, like really tight um, stuff. Um, and then I suppose a lot, maybe it was too much and a lot of um, other providers backed out. So we were we were the only ones who remained. Um, I don't know what happened with them. So I just assumed that maybe it was because of the guidelines. It's too much for like any practical tech company. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so after that, uh, we decided to collaborate. So one of our best collaboration, uh, so grateful to, to meet them, was with Aya. So Aya.ai, so the mm -hmm. company is led by Gian De La Rama. He's such a great guy. So he, he was like a big brother. So ba he basically became like the best big brother ever. So, uh, so we really appreciate them. So they were with Facebook then. Um, so we, when we requested, you know, could we just collaborate because we already have the full content. You have Facebook, so it's a perfect collaboration. Um, and then you have a team as well. So, yeah, so he was so nice and he said, you know, yeah, let's collaborate. And Facebook was also like welcoming. Okay, let's collaborate. So that was it. So, and then we had, you know, daily standups with them. And then we learned about daily standups and, and, you know, basically practices that they have too. So we learned a lot. And then, and yeah, so then the rest was history and Kira was born. So, yeah. Yeah. So if, if you can summarize it maybe in three bullets, what, what, what are the main functionalities of the of the Kira chatbot or the Kira the Kira solution uh, so first it's um, information so um, accessible information um, a bite-sized information uh, which is a close it's a closed bot system uh, because of the privacy policies that it has uh, the second one is the um, its connection with the DOH uh, knowledge base as they call it so another startup um, made a uh, they did knowledge mapping with um, uh, with DOH memorandums uh, and FAQs and uh, trained uh, their API. So we had an API with their um, knowledge base, that's what they call it. And then, uh, so Kira feeds that uh, and then it answers questions in a um, pretext. So if it picks up your intent, then it answers um, the question. And then we saw it develop as well. So from right, 30% um, correct to, I think right now it's already at 60% correct um, responses. Um, so yeah, so that's learning. And then of course, the third one would be the triaging, which is the very, very important part of the, of the solution. The triaging, uh, did, did you refer to like any existing literature or like a uh, health expert? To come up with the uh, kind of the workflow, so uh, how, how did you come about the uh, like, like the concept? So for the triage, what we did first in the prototype stage, we um, got different forms of uh, triaging systems, international practices, local practices, uh, different um, health groups in the Philippines. Uh, you're right, coming up with their own triages. Uh, so that's how we started. Uh, we uh, basically decomposed this and then the patterns in it, how the bots were being made for this one. And that's how we came up with the prototype. During the development with DOH, it was already closely guided by the Department of Health uh, doctors themselves. So uh, the creators of the algorithm for the, the DOH um, algorithm that they release officially. So we worked with them as well. So then it was, um, it was refined. Uh, and then we programmed it. We programmed the. It's it's not it's not complicated. It's simple. And then there was um. Or you make it sound simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At first there were so many combinations. I think in the beginning, right? The when you really you know when when you really um uh become super detailed about the algo, I think there was at least I don't know maybe a thousand plus a uh, uh, thousand plus combinations before that we had to program, and then it became simpler and simpler, and then the memorandum. Um, on the triaging also became simpler, which now we have like a 16 combination um, algo, which is so simple. So. so the 16 are the, like the, the, those are the possible paths or the possible combinations of responses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the- by, uh, by a user, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, okay. Uh, tell us about how, how was it working with DOH or government in general? I mean, you've been working with government before, but Particularly during a crisis, I mean, any any insights that you can share? 
Um, people in, in social media, they're always um, angry with DOH, but really, yeah. if you're working with DOH, they are they are great. So the people that compose DOH, rank and files, the coordinators, the directors, uh, people that you don't see in the media, people that are working just too hard that we want to build, mo you know, uh, monuments for them already. So they are so accommodating, so open. Um, to suggestions, to innovations. All you have to do is come up with an idea and it, that's brilliant, let's do it. You know, so that's, um, and then we work with them day and night. So we had messages, you know, at midnight, at one, at two. So we had <laughs> consultations. So it was an amazing journey. I, I would say that we had closer bonds with them and different units. So you come out uh, from the outside, you come in, you have no idea what the structures are inside. And then as you work with them, you know, patients, etc. you would then discover the different structures inside the government without knowing the formal structures. And then, yeah, so I, I would say everyone we encountered in the government, especially in DOH, were just amazing, too amazing to work with. So, yeah. Okay. Um, you, you mentioned there were lots of other chatbot providers. Uh, and even now, no, uh, I think... There are at least I don't know six uh, contact tracing apps. So in a way, your your solution is uh, can cover contact tracing as well, right? Or at least early warning in terms of symptoms. Uh, how how would you kind of rate, or how would you describe, you know, what what, what makes a a solution work for like a government contract? I mean, if uh, if uh, if you were gonna do it, I mean, if you were gonna distill your experience, no, what were the things that made your your approach preferable and and uh, were there areas that you could have done better as well you know, good and bad no? so I, any thoughts on that um, definitely the biggest insight would be you can't treat the public sector as you know the Silicon Valley style let's come up with an idea and then let's get it very fast so you can't you can't do that you can't do that no no uh -huh. no definitely not so that's a one of the bi biggest no's of uh, if you're a startup who wants to do public innovation, because it's not a, it's not a B two C model at all. Mm. So it's it's a it's a B two G model. So B two G and B two C are totally different things. Right? Totally different, yeah, yeah. Because you don't have a free market. There's no such thing as a free market when you're <laughs> when you're dealing with government. There's no market forces. What you have is an appreciation of policy structure and speaking the language, and speaking the language of. Uh, of government policy. So if you understand it, if you're immersed um, well enough, then you can navigate. So it's a navigation, um, it's a navigation journey and the patient's journey. So yeah, so B2G. So because uh, we saw a lot of startups during this pandemic, which is what you should expect of startups, um, act very quickly, you know, uh, deploy very quickly, and then let's uh, let it let it be. So you know, like the startup fantasy. Um, but um, in the case of uh, COVID and, and contact tracing and all of these, we saw it from the get-go as, um, no, this is a government-wide thing. This is a national scale thing. Whatever you do, there has to be government buy-in. So this is essentially from the get-go a government-owned solution. So when we had that insight, you know, beginning of March, March 15. There's no other way to go but with the government. You can't mm -hmm. go to the market and hear, you know, we're the most effective contact tracing app, so government just adopt us. You know, that's not how it is. So you have to always build. You have to always build. Um, Papa Pansin. <laughs> sorry. You always have to build it with the government um, themselves. So... You start from right their understanding of the government sector, aligning with the rank, you know, the rank and files, the directors, and what they need in order to be effective public servants. Um, so yeah, so basically, if you nav, you if you can navigate that, and if your heart is in the right place for COVID, you know, not making money out of <laughs> out of it, but basically having a solution that works, um, then you know, there's no. There's nothing stopping you from being an effective um, solutions provider. You know, there's there was always a fear. Of course, I, I know better now, having dealt with the government myself. Now, but I want to I want to know what you think of this. There was always the fear that dealing with the government can be difficult because of because of bidding, because of uh, I mean, just just put it out there because of uh, corruption and you know polit politics. So so, what's your view on that? I'm sure you've navigated that also. 
Um, to be honest, um, with the with my work uh, in the SWD then and uh, working with the DOH now and you know, in future working with DepEd, uh, the corruption part, I have not really personally seen it myself. Um, even working with the with the SWD, so I've always had the, I suppose a rosy, a rosy perspective in government because I've I've not encountered it my, myself, but definitely it exists, right? Because there are, yeah. there are. Um, but the way that I've always appreciated it is if there is corruption, that's not a person problem, that's a structure problem. So the incentives are not in the right place, the transparency is not in the right place, so the structure allows it, or the structure enables it or wants it to happen so, so so you know so i don't blame the people uh, but i blame how it is designed and therefore if you want a solution for that you go for the design and the structure and you know putting putting engineering the the, the system mm-hmm. um, um so yeah uh, when it comes naman to bidding and uh, winning stuff for the government it's patience on trying to um comply to all policies that that they want you know for for the doh so we had a chunk of requirements legal requirements um questionnaires technical requirements you know all of these shebangs that you have to comply with and at that time we were like oh you know let's just give up we have you know made so much sacrifices and we are dealt with so much compliance that we have to work in and then on top of that they have to own all of the source codes so there's really no no money making anything in this you know it's essentially a a bad a bad bad deal but if you get out of that perspective and you see it on another way then you will um i suppose arise uh you know what, what we did uh was we just complied we we took the painstaking job of um, doing everything, we went for a legal consulting a firm to make sure that we are, you know, we are, we are not, everything, yeah, right? Yeah. Everything is correct, even though we don't have a lawyer um, amongst us. So yeah, so after we got off that hill, that that's it. You know, this is the worst thing that you know the government can do to you, and we have done it. So after this, everything is is a walk in the park. So yeah. walk in the park, which is. Amazing for someone for someone dealing with the government. That's kind of like one of the last things people would expect. Okay, okay. Um, well, we're coming we're coming close to the hour, uh, and maybe what one of the few questions, uh, last few questions I want to ask. So let's bring it back to you, kind of you as a founder. Um, and obviously, it, it it does make sense you would start a GovTech uh, company because you you were dealing with the government. So I guess now while you're now in the thick of it, no. Um, any any particular, uh, I would say, enduring wisdom that you've now picked up by now, no? or if, if you had the opportunity to t- talk to yourself, you know, when you were starting, uh, what are things that you would you would kind of put in your kind of rules of how to make this work, you know? Uh, and of course, it's still evolving, but uh, you know, and that's one. And second is, in terms of fulfillment. Uh, talk a little bit about that too, like uh, in, especially with respect to your future plans. Uh, obviously, there's more than contra COVID is just one of many projects that you potentially want to do. So those two things, I'm gonna. Uh, first is any any pocket wisdom you would you would send back in time to yourself or, or anyone else looking to set set something similar up. And then second is uh, talk about fulfillment and future plans. What are you looking at for? Not just for AI for God, but for yourself now as a founder. Uh, number one definitely is courage. You know, courage and uh, persistence. So courage and persistence, because the government, um, the government context is hard. It's a high road. It's a high road to, to to deal with. It doesn't come with, um, you know, short pleasures of you know seeing a market, having sales, no such thing as that. It's yep. Trust. You have to. There's a lot of faith involved. So, you just have faith in people in the government, and they would navigate for you. So that's the that's the, you know, have faith in people basically, and high trust, high trust, courage, yun. So basically, the mindset that you should have, in order to survive public uh, sector, the public sector market. Um, that's one, um, and then the second one um, uh, would be. 
collaborate with the right people. So mm. they collaborate with the right. There are a lot of forces, and they are very complex forces. And um, but inside those forces, you'd be surprised that there are um, there are people who align, who align, you know, who who are aligned, who are doing it for the right reasons, and usually it's for geeky reasons. <laughs> so uh, we found that in you know with GN's team. He, so the, the, the heart is really there. Uh, so you resonate with that. You won't see it in, you know, in other, in, you, you, you would really feel it. So that's great. And then there's also the likes of Dr. Rina uh, from Acre, right? From Faster. She, uh, it's women. So women, S-O-R. women, yeah. S-O-R, yeah. women to women empowerment. It's, it's the best. So she, uh, she took us in. She supported us. Um, basically, you raise each other up in, in that context. And then um, during calls, right, we're powerless because kasi, kasi being brought up in a community development sense, I, you always have that perspective of power. Agency power, that's basically sure. how we are, you know, how we are, how we are molded. And she, and you know, she, I, I really appreciate how she um, gave us leverages that even though we're young, we're inexperienced. She saw how we worked and we worked hard. And she basically, you know, took that and and um, collaborated with us. And that's how Tanod Contra COVID um, happened, the integration between those two applications. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, fulfillment, future plans. Yeah. Uh, fulfillment and future plans. It's really exciting. So we're super excited to continue working with uh, government and government innovations because right now uh, we have proven traction. Uh, we are not afraid anymore that we are young and that's the government and so many things that you could be um, in jail for. <laughs> so not, not afraid anymore. Um, and we are uh, hoping to continue innovating with local government. So right now we have accessed a lot of local governments. Um, basically, had a better view of the market as well, and uh, we hope to continue the research, the research on the models that we wanted to develop and uh, have that more grounded. So we didn't win any money uh, with uh, with our work, but we won a lot of knowledge, and I think that's. Um, that's great for for our I know for the in the level that we are in in the in the startup journey. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Lay, for sharing your journey. Obviously, the the reason why we wanted to talk to you is there aren't. I would say there are. Let's phrase it positively. I th- I uh, I'd say there could be more opportunity if people saw that GovTech. Particularly AI for gov no? um, type startups, I think it's it's two hurdles. Because hey, you're 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 you 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 pretty much hurdled three things. Number one, doing it so early in your career, which is fantastic. It's always good, inspiring. Uh, second is getting into uh, deep technology like uh, artificial intelligence, chatbots. That's one hurdle already. And then third is uh, you know getting into government contracts. So those are like three hurdles that most people wouldn't even get into the first, uh, much less all three, and, and, and you're navigating it, continuing to navigate it. And that, you know, that's great. Uh, it's great. I mean, it's inspirational for everyone. You know, thanks for your, thanks for your journey. And thanks for sharing it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but it's really a th- teamwork. So definitely the team behind it, they don't sleep, they don't eat. <laughs> but, but, you know, so we always remind each other that, Let's not get burned out and let's keep the high morale going. And I think there's a lot of that in the team. High morale every day. <laughs> yeah, so, you need a lot of morale supply. <laughs> <laughs> all sorts of inspiration, the morale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Okay. 